Okay, theoretically, we should be streaming. Let me do a quick audio check. This is the official audio check of the Security in 30 podcast. Are we live yet? No, I don't think we're live yet. We are live. Oh, not, not, oh, not for me yet on Twitch. Ah. <clears throat> Here, okay. live. Okay. All right. Uh, I need Audacity, and I'm good. Okay. Okay, we're live. Okay. You let me know when you're ready. I'm good. Okay. 249. Okay. Hold on. <clears throat> okay. Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 249 of the Security Podcast here on the In30 Network. I know it's been a while, but all the kids are remotely Zooming from school. And yeah, we had stuff to do. Uh, as you know, I'm a school teacher, so we had to learn how to use, I don't know if you've ever heard of these, uh, Clever, Clover, Seesaw, Zoom, Teams, OneNote, Canvas, Blackboard. Uh, I don't know how many of these work with COPPA, but somebody told me they do, which they don't, but they said they did. Anyway, so we're learning how to do all of this. And so if your son or daughter is at home, the Q, to log into your Chromebook using a QR code. So again, if your son or daughter is at, uh, at home trying to figure all this out or you're trying to figure this out, trust me, it's not the teacher's fault. They were thrown this yesterday or two days ago, last week, wherever it is, especially if you're a September school start. And we're trying to figure it out. It's e use this email, use this link, use that and the other thing. So just bear with them and don't start yelling for another week or so. Um, with that said, then the next question is how safe is everybody? And that's going to be our topic today. So today we in the WhatsApp group. So first off, everyone should be joining the WhatsApp group. Uh, find us on Twitter, find us wherever. And came up again with how come we're not using contact tracing apps and mainly how come everywhere else in the world is using contact tracing apps, but not Americans. And so we figured we, we did two episodes back in the spring about this, but let's do it again. So I'm going to let Tom start because he did a whole lot of research and he can start with what we're doing. Um, so I'm, I'm going to avoid being too overtly political. Uh, in this show, because this is not a politics show. We, we try to try to keep our opinions to ourselves and give you the security news. And that's about it. Unfortunately, there's there's some politics wrapped up in this that we're going to have to get into. So just just an upfront content warning. Um, so contact tracing. Um, the general idea is that you can use um, like a, an always on government tracking device it's it's a smartphone. You, you can literally just use a smartphone and something like Bluetooth or some apps are using GPS, which isn't a good idea, but we'll get to that here in a minute. Um, and if it's in contact with another smartphone, um, then you know roughly that, you know, two individuals were within Bluetooth range of each other. Um, you combine that with like a system, some sort of, you know, database or on-device system that says, you know, I'm either not infected or I am infected. Uh, and it could let you know, hey, guess what, buddy? Uh, you might have been exposed to COVID-19. It's, it's kind of a, an early warning sort of application. Um, and, you know, from a pure technology standpoint, it's not a terrible idea. Um, now, well, go ahead. I was going to say, let me, take, let me take a step back first. So if I got a, I got a COVID test on Saturday. Let's say it takes 48 hours. Um, I'm not sick. I, I was at the doctor's anyway. But let's say it takes 48 hours. Can you describe to somebody on the phone or to anybody where were all your stops in the last 48 hours? That's the real problem. And people who say they don't go anywhere. No, Tom literally doesn't go anywhere. But I and and I'm out and about. I'm, I'm more cognizant of where I am. But for the most part, uh, I'm out and about. But let's ask you this. Where were you? Did you go to the grocery store? Did you go get gas? Did you pick up your kids? Uh, did you go, you're shopping for school? Did you go to Target? Did you do, did you go to Walmart? Did, did, uh, did you go to wherever, Wawa or 7-Eleven to get something? 
and you will find out that you're outside more than you think in this time. So to say, where were you? is really hard to do and if you miss one of those places you could be it could be a problem so that's that's the whole point behind the contact tracing they're just trying to find out where you were and you're not maliciously lying to them but oh you forgot that you went to that you took a walk today and you said hi to your three neighbors yeah and it's it's not only like where you were but it's what exact time or approximate time were you there like if you went to the grocery store what like cash register did you go to who was on shift at that time did they have to have a manager come help because the system froze up like there's a lot of questions now this is contact tracing and health departments have done this for a very long time to figure out you know how infections are spreading right this happens all the time with the flu it's not just a covid thing like contact tracing is a well-trodden area of medical science and frankly it's really cool we can actually through contact tracing through effective medical detective work uh figure out exactly how viruses and, and sickness spreads throughout a community and a population and it's super awesome so why don't we use the the wireless tracking devices we're all carrying in our pockets at all times of the day to do that work for us uh, right now, manual medical contact tracers are in very short supply. Um, it's intensive detective work. Um, it's it's pretty invasive because you're literally asking somebody like like a cop shining a light on somebody. Where were you on this night? Did you talk to these people? Did you use register four? Um, and it's just too much work. With a global pandemic like this, it's they're they're flooded. They're just flooded with way too much work and not enough people. So maybe we could use technology to help this out. And uh, that's why when this thing kicked off, a lot of technologists were at a loss. We're sitting at home. You know, some of us are working from home if, if we're lucky. Others are not, which really sucks. And we're all sitting around wondering, what can we do to help? So some technologists did build these contact tracing apps. Some of them pretty well, some of them not so well. And then Google and Apple, in a rare show of like teaming up against all the odds, decided to pair up and tackle this thing together uh, in a comprehensive and privacy aware way um, that crosses OS boundaries. Like it's, it's honestly fantastic to see these companies coming together for the common good. And I actually know some people who worked on it, but um, anyway, on both companies. But again, so they said, we're going to do it. And the good part is what I initially liked is they said, uh, we're going to do it, but we're not going to make the app. We're just going to make the APIs. And so, so we don't, anybody say, oh, they're just trying to slurp up data or whatever. What, what's the conspiracy theory? Uh, they're, we don't, COVID tracing apps have the 5G microchip in them or whatever nonsense. There was some conspiracy theory that if a vaccine comes out, Bill Gates is inserting five microchips into you. Anyway, can, they can we nip that in the bud real quick? You don't need a tracking microchip inserted into you at all. You're carrying a whole bunch. They're right here. Yeah. If somebody wants to track you, it's all in this device. Nobody has to inject you with anything. Sorry, just wanted to set the record straight there. You're carrying a tracking device. You don't need it injected. And while we're talking about that, 5G is not is not they're not tracking you because 4g was supposed to track you and remember when 4g was supposed to track you 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 didn't want that because 3g was tracking you and there was no 2g but there were uh the radiation from there like grow your brain or something like that and then bluetooth was, so all the g's were tracking us um but guess what nobody but, cares but what about the ogs were the, the ogs OG tracking us I'm sure they were. I'm sure everyone. I mean, there was, you couldn't live next to a, uh, uh, an electrical tower. You couldn't live next to a cell tower. Um, yeah, it, it was a problem. So Google and Apple said, you know what? We don't want to be, we don't want people to accuse us of anything. Uh, so we're just going to build the APIs. You do whatever you want with them. We're going to embed it into our phone. We're going to make sure it works. And we're going to go from there. Because really the first part, well, well, Tom will get there, but the problem of, of what, what is critical mass? You need people to install this. 
and you can't just put it on people's phones because that's a, that is a huge invasion of privacy, but you need to get it on people's phone and they have to know how to use it and everything else. So you have to teach people. And again, we still can't fix the clock on our VCR. We just, we just eradicated the problem by getting rid of the VCR. Exactly. That's the solution to most technological problems is if a system is hard to use or hard to configure, just deprecate it. Just say not, not supported anymore and get rid of it. It's a fantastic pastime among tech companies. So, <laughs> so let's use your show notes. What's first? So, okay. Early apps. Let's get into early apps and why they aren't great and why Google and Apple need to team up in the first place. So early applications were using things like GPS based location, which isn't fantastic, especially inside of buildings, which is where you're really most concerned about, you know, COVID exposure because outdoors seems to be a little, according to medical professionals, a little less risky than indoor. Um, but GPS is accurate within about, I'm sorry, I'm an American. I'm going to use American measurements. I apologize. Accurate to within about 16 feet. Um, and the general guidance for social distancing is you have to stay six feet apart. So you could be getting a whole lot of false positives about being exposed to somebody who's on the other side of the street, or if, you, if your GPS is anything like mine, in a big city with a bunch of big towers and a bunch of reflections, sometimes it puts me on the other side of a street or on the other side of a building. It's just, it's not great. Um, the other thing is that there's a bunch of really bad privacy concerns, especially with location-based tracking, because some of these apps were decentralized, which is great, and the data lived on your device. Other apps, were centralized. Your data was shot off to some server somewhere and, you know, you don't really control it at that point. Um, there were a lot of issues. So when Google and Apple teamed up, they built this thing, it's privacy aware, it's privacy conscious. Uh, and the, the notifications and analysis happens purely on your device. Doesn't go anywhere other than that. It's literally just on your device. The only thing it does is download data of positively identified unique identifiers, which we'll get to in a little bit. But in general, to make these things work, it's been estimated that you need about 56 to 60% of a country's population to install this thing to really put a hampering on the virus. Now, there are some countries like um, like Ireland. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna search my show notes here. Um, so Ireland has about 40% of their smartphone users have installed their country's COVID tracker app. In Switzerland, about 35% of smartphone users. And even in these smaller numbers, it has put a, a nice, you know, small dent in the infection rate. Um, it's not incredible, but it's better, which is really all we're aiming for. We're not going to get a perfect system here. These are humans we're talking about. Um, but I mean, the, the East Asian countries, they take it one step further. You have to prove that you're negative. So anywhere you go, you have to scan a QR code that says you were negative, but that gets into testing, which is later. So, so this is just saying you need this app on your phone. It has to be running. That's the other thing. You restart your phone. It has to always be running. And, and, and for, for homegrown yeah. apps, that's just not really a thing, especially like on Android. If you've ever seen, you know, we're putting this notification here to keep the app running. That's kind of what Android developers have had to do to keep their stuff running. On iOS, you don't have that kind of luxury. Should I say luxury? I don't know. It's better for my battery life, but the app would close. And more importantly, if your app is using like Bluetooth to send out the pings instead of location data, which is better, it's a more privacy aware and technologically conscious option. Um, when your phone screen is off, if it's off, if it's locked, iOS doesn't send out those pings. It, it puts a stop to it. So early testing of some apps showed that only 4% of iPhone users could effectively use these COVID tracker apps before the new APIs, because to actually use it, you had to keep your phone on and unlocked the entire time. There were actually some countries that were mandating you walk around with an unlocked iPhone because they wanted to track COVID. Um, it's, it's not anything nefarious or evil. They're literally just trying to keep people healthy. Uh, but it's, it's not great. It's not usable. So Apple and Google built in OS level APIs to make these apps a reality. And well, I got nothing else from there. I was going to move on, <laughs> but yeah. So uh... in the U S 
uh, which we're going to talk a lot about the U.S. because guess what? We're, <laughs> we're, we're Americans. We're, we're here. Um, and I don't want to speak on behalf of other countries without you know, being there and having the experience. But um, in the U.S., the main issue with these apps is the fractured U.S. healthcare system. It's all very privatized. There's a bunch of different silos. Each state has got their own sort of systems to work with. Um, there's not one unified place to go for this kind of data or tracking or really information, right? What what do we do about COVID-19? What, what kind of precautions do we take, right? We're getting stuff from like the CDC and the National Institutes of Health, and we're, we're getting it from all over these places. And then locally, if you're looking for local information it's sometimes it's by county sometimes it's by city sometimes it's by state sometimes it's by that guy that you live next door to who watches conspiracy videos on youtube like the healthcare system in the u.s is kind of all over the place so so if you don't if you don't follow me on twitter um every day i take what the governor puts out as his daily stats and i put uh deaths case count hospitalizations and rate of transmission value i i think i've been doing this every day on Facebook for two months, Twitter has been about three weeks. And and exactly what you're saying, there's 71 hospitals in New Jersey and at whatever, 10 a.m. or 11 a.m., the governor comes out and reads what's going on. And sometimes he says 69 out of 71 hospitals have reported. Well, wait a second. Why couldn't they all report? Like, like where, they can't, they know he's coming out. They know they need to do this every day. What's going on? And when I post the death count, a lot of times it says uh, these seven deaths happened, but they weren't yesterday, but they just finally got around to it. That's the other problem. So I want to say seven deaths happened today, but probably only one happened today and six happened uh, within in the last three months because they'll say we're reporting one from May, two from July, one from August. And you're like, this should have been way easier to do, but it's not. So contributing to that, and this, this is actually a pretty cool feature. Unfortunately, I don't see it getting wide adoption in the US anytime soon. So I'm on my iPhone. I'm going to click settings. I'm going to go down to exposure notifications and then click turn on. So I'll select where I'm at. We're going to go US. And uh, I don't think it's too bad to give a state as a, as a rough estimate of where I live. If you know that I roam around Seattle, you probably guessed I'm in Washington state. Um, but unfortunately, when I try to enable these on my phone, it says that, yeah, exposure notifications, they're not currently available. I know the text is really blurry. I apologize for that. But it takes a, a state coming to Apple or Google and saying, hey, we would like to enable this for our state. Right now, there are only six states out of 50 in the U.S. who have elected to enable this. Alabama. Arizona, Nevada, North Dakota, Virginia, and Wyoming. Everyone else can't turn on exposure notifications because the states haven't allowed it. This is a problem, especially in the U.S. where some states are relatively small, right? If you live in New Jersey and you work in New York, you're going back and forth all the time. If one of those states decides to enable exposure notifications and the other one doesn't, you're protected while you're in the state that has it, but not when you get back home where it might be more important right it's it's not great we just don't have the the health infrastructure in the u.s to make this work properly which is really frustrating well the, the bigger problem is, is that okay so these six states have it and the other states don't and instead of working together and saying hey can we just use one band behind one of them it was we're going to make ours better and ours better and ours better and we're not going to wait for Google and Apple. We're going to make our own APIs, which have shown to leak data, which is we're getting to. And so, yeah, we can't just unify behind one platform or one group of apps because we can't agree on which one is better or worse or whatever it is. So, so, and the good thing is New York, New Jersey, and I want to say Connecticut all banded together and say the three of us, and I think Massachusetts and are banded together and say what one does all three of us do, which still bothers me because they should have an app. We were on the forefront of this. They should absolutely say, hey, Google, uh, Google member, Google's in New York City. Can you help us build something? Like, 
or let's get some money to actually build something but no they haven't so it's it's a problem that these apps don't exist and they only exist in six states and and there's like a 30 percent adoption yeah it's it's not great um so the new system from a technology perspective is pretty cool i'll get into that here in a bit um the the new system is using bluetooth low energy which is about six feet of range um which is great because that's conveniently the social distancing range unfortunately bluetooth is finicky if you've ever used a bluetooth device you know it's finicky um depending on how you've got your device oriented it actually changes the profile of the the radio waves it's sending out like it's a different shape so depending on how your device is oriented it could be stronger than it should be or weaker than it should be compared to the other device in its orientation like it's it's complicated it's radio technology it's annoying to deal with from a hardware perspective um but even more than that it has to go through bodies like if you're at a grocery store it's got to go through shelves and boxes of food and you know metal stuff and then whatever the grocery store's radio waves are putting out because yeah grocery stores have wi-fi and a lot of trackers and various other electronic devices that create interference um and in one test it actually showed that if you're standing back to back with a person who has covid and has you know their phone set to say you know yes i'm infected the notification the exposure notification doesn't fire as often as it should it's it's pretty lossy which isn't great either um it's again it's better than nothing but it's not it's not great um so i'm gonna i'm gonna save behavioral issues to the last part because i think that's more important the tech details though are super cool um so originally these applications the ones that were really well built but without google and apple's apis um had rotating ephemeral ids so you know one minute you are you're this sticker right you're you're, you've got you know six we're going to simplify all the identifiers right so you've got six and then 15 minutes later it changes and then it's one And then then it changes again and it's five. Unfortunately, Bluetooth Low Energy has its own set of security features which rotates MAC addresses. If you don't rotate them at the same time, I'll show you what happens. So you've got your your Bluetooth MAC address, we'll call it blue, right? And then you've got your ephemeral ID, we'll call it six. Now, your Bluetooth identifier rotates every so often as well. So it's blue six right now, we're gonna change it It's going to be green six. Now your application rotates its ephemeral ID. It is now green one. You start to see the picture. Let me go a bit further. Bluetooth rotates. It's now yellow one. Ephemeral ID rotates. It's now yellow five. What this means is that by switching which identifier you're tracking, you can actually trace a single person due to the combination of these identifiers being rotated at different rates. You can track a person as long as you are within their range. Again, it's low because it's Bluetooth, but you can track them, one individual, around a store or around wherever. And it's kind of a big issue. Luckily, in uh, Apple and Google's APIs, these are rotated at the same time. So it looks like you're a completely different person, which is great. yeah, it's it, the, the old apps were kind of a mess, to be honest, in, in so many ways. Um, well, they pushed it out. They, it yeah. comes in March or March, and then, okay, we need some sort of contract chasing app. So in two months, they did this. There was no beta testing. There was no privacy testing. They pushed it out. And however they worked, nobody did a security check upon it. So somebody has to store the data. The contact tracers need to to de-anonymize this data so they can do their job. And it was just, it's, and no one knew how it worked. And now all of a sudden we're finding out that it's leaking data. And again, the state doesn't want to tell everyone to re-download something. And again, we didn't even talk about how do you get people to download this? Like we say 30%, you literally have to we put billboards up, download this, download that. And then, then you get CBS at 11 o'clock, which app is the federal government is stealing your data. 
Or somebody will say, and we're going to get into behavior, but they're going to go into behavior tracking. They don't want to know where were you last night? Guess what? If you have this COVID exposure app, they know uh, details at 11. So it's it goes by back to, I don't want to download this. Is it stealing my data? All the conspiracy theorists are going to be out saying this is the government's uh, way of getting us. And then at the end of the day, how do they, when you, maybe you can't uninstall it. Maybe it flips some sort of switch that's uninstallable and it will be passed down. So that was the other problem that we kept on hearing, just constant reasons not to download it. So if you're on iOS, it's built into the OS. Apple pushed it a while ago. It is built in. Um, and by default, it's opt-in, which is fantastic. That is a privacy conscious choice. You have to enable it. And if you don't, it just, it doesn't do anything. Uh, now there is an auto enabled notification for if the exposure notification program goes live in your area, based on your phone's location, it will tell you. On Google's side, unfortunately, due to the way the Android ecosystem is fragmented and everyone and their mother has built their own flavor of Android, they can't really install anything into the OS itself. So Google state by state in the states that have enabled this has built or helped build various applications per state. So if you're in Alabama, Arizona, Nevada, North Dakota, Virginia, or Wyoming, you can download the official Google application for exposure notifications. Um, it's, it's a really cool system and it's decentralized. It all happens on your device. So you've got these rotating identifiers and every so often your phone will just download a new pack, a new bundle of these identifiers were positive for COVID and your device will literally go down the list and check each one individually and say, oh, no, nope, these two match. You were, you were in proximity for long enough to one of these you know, officially sanctioned identifiers, you might want to get tested. Um, and the way that they handle false positives is also kind of cool. They work with um, healthcare providers to actually generate a, like, basically like those email links where you click to verify your email address and it's got the big giant unique code. It's that you type in a verification code given to you by a healthcare provider that says, yes, it's positive because they don't want people trolling the system and saying that they're positive and they're, it's actually kind of a nice verification system. But let's get into behaviors. Um, so uh, this is, we, we had a big giant discussion in the WhatsApp group about this. I know I'm rehashing it. Um, if someone relies on this app or a series of these apps to drive their own personal behavior, then they could be operating under a false negative belief. And trust me, people use weird reasons to justify their own selfishness. Well, it's cool. I went to the bar, but app says I'm green, man. We're good. So well, well I was going to say something else. I was going to say, uh, if you have contact tracing there, if you went to your, uh, your street, your local street pharmacist, and you had to explain, and the contact tracer found it. Are you going to be arrested for partaking in illegal activity? And I know I'm sensationalizing it a little bit, but we actually had a story in New Jersey. A, a 25 teenagers went to, a, a, I guess they call them raging keggers. Is that I don't know if that's still the the term. Lots of people, lots of uh, kegs of beer. And since they were all underage, they refused to talk to the contact tracers because they didn't want to get in trouble or fined or whatever else. And it's hard to say, yes, we're the, we're the government, but no, we won't prosecute you if you give us information. Or you're, uh, you're having an affair and you don't want somebody else, your obvious, your spouse to know, things like that. So there's first, first the behavior you're talking about, but the second is the, is the, the potentially shady activity you shouldn't be dealing with in the first place. Yeah, it's... It's kind of a complicated mess. So the other thing to keep in mind is not everybody has these apps. So even if you're exposed, you can't really be sure because does the exposed person have this app? Is it enabled for them? Or did they mark their thing as positive? Because it does require the user to self-select, yes, I'm positive, and then give the healthcare provider code. It's not an automatic thing because it's decentralized and based on you know people taking 
personal responsibility, which try not to be political. We're not I've been, doing. I've been wanting more of in the general populace for a very long time. Uh, so if a person decides to go to a party because the app says you're good, they could have been exposed and not even know. People could die because of that behavior. Um, I, I, another you know, consideration is people who, you know, have COVID or have been exposed and they aren't presenting symptoms either because it hasn't been long enough or there have been cases where people just don't show symptoms. So it's like, it's like they're a zombie and they bit you, but you don't know they're a zombie because they don't look like a zombie. I realize this is getting out of control, but you know, they wouldn't know. Uh, eventually, like if you have all this in a centralized database, you could use like a, a graph system to figure out here's one person who's been exposing everyone, but in a decentralized model that doesn't work great. It's really hard to do that. Um, the, the various apps, they don't work together. Um, it, the apps like the exposure notifications are limited to just that thing before the Google and Apple API. It's, it's complicated. I, I don't, I don't want to say, you know, don't download this due to these reasons. Every little bit helps. If I, I thought about it a lot today, and uh, frankly, over this week, if I had the ability to enable exposure notifications, I would. Unfortunately, the state I live in doesn't think that that's important right now. There are people in groups saying that these applications are a sideshow. I think there is a, a, a part that technology could play in helping curb this virus, but it's it's hubris to think that technology has all the answers here. It's it's all about personal responsibility, doing the right thing, and frankly, just sucking it up. Watch well, the office for the fifth time. Like, come on, guys. So well look, it's the it's I live in New Jersey and we've been on perpetual lockdown since March. And they start peeling back slowly and everyone's really, really getting antsy about trying to go out because you do hear there were seven deaths yesterday. And while that seven deaths is, is tragic, it's not we had a thousand deaths in a different state or a different country or whatever it is. And so you say, oh, my exposure is not that. And then you hear about, well, cases are not really hospitalization, so I'm going to go do this. Do I really need to be six feet apart? I'm outside. The science says if I'm outside, I'm in the best possible spot. So maybe I'll pull my mask down my nose. And... And again, the mask goes over your nose. That that that's the key there. And and so everyone is being. I I notice I'm being a little more lax. Like I, it's I was very diligent in washing my hands. Now it's I'm diligent but not diligent enough. And so it's it's we're getting tired. We're, we're everyone's getting really tired of this. And people want to have fun. And it's the last vestiges of summer. And they want to go out and. Maybe if we don't get these contact tracing apps now, we'll get it for the flu season. Maybe we should start working on some, not another pandemic, because we don't want to plan for another pandemic, but maybe the flu, maybe something else that will be not, because the flu is coming and that's going to be another problem. And so whatever we can do to, to help it, to, to help it, whether that be more personal responsibility, more mask wearing, just wear the mask. I, I can't say that enough. If you can't, if your mask is bothering you, you have an ill-fitting mask. My wife made masks. I can wear them all day. They don't bother me. They're not hard to, they're, they're, they're some template. But if your mask is not fitting you, you have a bad mask. So just, just so you guys are aware, okay. um, Apple and Google have committed to removing this API in a future update. In a post-COVID world, Google and Apple will push an update to Android and iOS to remove this API, essentially killing all the apps that use it, which is great because we, we wanted a basically a, a guarantee or a promise from these companies that says, yeah, we're not really going to use this other than this one application, and they have committed to getting rid of this. Now, the code will still be there, right, if there is another pandemic. God forbid, maybe this is going to be one of those solved problems that we can come back to. Maybe maybe we'll be better prepared next time. And just as a general PSA, think about the people who aren't you, who aren't in front of you, who you could be affecting. I've literally been in my apartment since like the first week of March. 
I am one of those at-risk people that if I get this thing, I will probably die. There is a greater than 50% chance that I'm going to kick the bucket if I get COVID-19. So when you're out there, when you're doing stuff, when when you're pulling your mask down over your nose, or I saw somebody literally take their mask off to cough, think of killing me and try to make a responsible choice. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, had to get a little bit real there. I, I, I mean, we talk about this all the time. Yes, you are in a high-risk group. But I, I think that's the problem. I'm going to go out to a party tonight, and you know what? I'm just going to stay in my uh, my 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 80 person dorm room, and maybe I'll go home. But you know what? It's not my grandmother. That that that's really what it is. It's not my grandmother. Those people should be careful. It's like, but everyone has a grandmother, or everyone has somebody that they know, or maybe your neighbor, and you just don't know because they're not going around broadcasting that they're that they have all these comorbidities or whatever else. But anyway, we're out of time. I thought this went really well, and and again, come to the WhatsApp group, find us, message us. We're more than happy to talk about this more. But it's it's obviously a huge topic on how on how to do this correctly because there are really no answers. And a whole lot of people trying and not a whole lot of people like taking the bait for this. So anyway, we're going to end and we will talk to everyone next week, hopefully. Bye, everyone. See ya.